one of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. We need a different economic model that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet and that will be focused not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, but how do we get it and implement it at the scale we need at a price that people around the world can afford? If we're able to do something to transform cities, to make them more efficient, then the impact can be huge. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The question of adding quality to quantity, it's really about a diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, clean energy. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. The prediction of 5 million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but the main question is how will we define work? How will we share the wealth? How can you have a doctor that really knows a lot about data? How can you have a biologist that knows about medicine? We have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. We really need a new education or new training. We're working with a world in motion in FIRST Robotics, trying to encourage students from third grade all the way up through the end of high school to pursue science, math, and different technologies. It's this ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people that can create a more equitable growth fourth industrial revolution has the potential to make inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot. The cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to make it happen. We're seeing this incredibly exciting convergence of genome editing, DNA sequencing. Governments have a very important role to play in enabling the safe and effective use of technologies. We need to take responsibility at every level of society to adapt to these technological challenges which are redefining what it means to be completely embedded in this world. Even though we have everyday problems we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. Well, good afternoon, everybody. After that inspiring set of videos and comments, we are going to talk now about technology-driven, human-centered change, the fourth industrial revolution. We've heard a lot in recent years about income inequality and all the social and political challenges that's posing. Um, in some, say, some ways, though, what we ought to be moving on to talking about is also technology inequality, digital inequality, because in some ways, the digital revolution we're living through is incredibly exciting, inspiring. Many people think that that could be the key to meeting the sustainable development goals and actually making the world much more livable, much more human, much more equitable. But at the same time, technology has a very dark side too. You don't have to be necessarily an alarmist to be worried about some of the AI aspects or some of the potential to displace jobs. Then, of course, there's the issue about digital um, inequality and the fact that not everyone has access to this amazing new transformative technology. Now, just before we did the session, um, the World Economic Forum did a Twitter poll to see how people out there felt about technology. Um, admittedly, anyone on Twitter reading WEF posts is already quite a self-selecting group. <laughs> so this isn't entirely random. But what it showed was that at least the WEF followers on Twitter, who follow tags like WEF Impact, um, are wildly, wildly optimistic. That's the good news. 63% of people apparently say they're optimistic that technology can help, um, help the world meet the global goals. 29% said it's complicated. Those are probably teenagers. And 8% were pessimistic, but only 8 were pessimistic. 63% said you were technology optimists, and out of those, um, the... Um, the SDGs they felt most excited about solving with technology were sustainable energy, followed by environmental pollution, 
Um, 11% said plastics in the ocean, which would be interesting to talk about. And in fact, when you were, they were asked by 2030, how will technology have impacted your life? 54% said for the better. Only 16% for, said for the worse. So lots of optimism about, which frankly is welcome given the state of the world in other aspects um, today, but we're going to be hearing, hearing from the panel now about how they see technology playing into the drive to meet the sustainable goals. Are they equally optimistic? Are they concerned? And if so, what do, do we all need to be doing? Perhaps I can start with someone from the private sector, Mark Benioff. We've got a great selection of people here. I haven't introduced them, but let me quickly introduce them. Um, I won't do long biographies, but we have on my immediate left, your right, the lone um, voice of the public sector on the panel, who deserves um, kudos for appearing, Jay Inslee, Governor of Washington, which of course has many of the big tech companies and is grappling with much of the issues there. Um, next to him, we have Sunil Bharti Mittal, who's Chairman of Bharti Enterprises um, and has long been um, a stalwart in many of the international efforts to address these issues. Next to him, we have Marianne Eve Jam, who is founder and CEO of Spot One Global Solutions, based in the United Kingdom, but spends a lot of time in Africa trying to bring technology to Africa. Next to her, we have Mark Benioff, who's Chairman and CEO of Salesforce. And at the end, we have um, Johan Rogström, who's executive director of the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden, who looks particularly at the issue of environment and technology. But Mark, I'd like to start with you. Um, are you feeling optimistic? Are you as optimistic as that Twitter poll in terms of the impact um, of technology and the way people can harness it in a positive way? Well, I think you framed it actually quite beautifully, the way you've kind of set this up, because um, you know, there's this incredible tension right now between this dramatic innovation that is occurring, um, but also th there's uh, th these issues of equality. And this is, I think, going to be really our dialogue for the next decade. Um, we all know that this innovation is dramatic that is happening. And, you know, there's many powerful aspects of what we call here at the World Economic Forum the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is a wide range of advancements of innovation in information technologies and bio, uh, 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 biotechnologies and so forth and so on. And in each one of these, they have the opportunity to move the world forward in, in really incredible ways. If you look at each one of the SDG goals, we just took some time and went through and looked at each one, and food, and poverty, and the oceans, and the areas of gender equality, on, across the board, and I'd like to hit some of them later in the session, you know, we can dramatically improve all these things through these advancements of, the, of technology. But, and, and let me give you like an example though. Let me give you a but, example. So, you know, very recently, just right here in this harbor, there was a, a major new uh, battleship launched, you know, but the battleship that was launched was an autonomous battleship. And um, uh, it's not the first one launched here. And, also, um, you know, there's many nation states that are launching autonomous battleships. So by that you mean a self-driving battleship? Self-drive, you can, I'll... That beats I, a self-driving taxi anyway. Right, day. right, I, sh I, can, I can give you, I can t dumb down the words if it's better. But this idea that you have this autonomous battleship, self-driving battleship, um, there's, no sailors, there's no sailors on the battleship, right? Um, uh, it's, a, it's the beginning of a navy without sailors. We can all imagine that because these ships are driving around the ocean right now, self-propelled, and there is no sailors on the battleships. Now, of course, there's no sailors on the battleships. There's also not going to be any pilots on the planes. You know, where I, in San Francisco, where I am from, we have taxis without taxi drivers. We have trucks, big, you know, big car trucks going down the highway without truck drivers. Um, we have grocery stores in the governor's state without cashiers. Okay, no cashiers in the grocery stores. And we can kind of start to go on and on and on where we have militaries without, you know, without inf infantry. And this is all possible through this incredible wave of new technology. But when we look at that technology, that's when we really have to start to ask ourselves, well, okay, here's this amazing new AI technology. You know, if I have access to this AI technology, maybe I'm gonna be wealthier because I can you know, trade currencies and this kind of thing better. Maybe I'm gonna be smarter because I 
have access to education and this kind of thing. Maybe um, um, there's going to be some. Maybe I'm be healthier because right. you know all of the all of my medical data is now being you know intelligently brought to me you know through smart devices and through sensors. So. That, those are some powerful dimensions, and you don't have to apply that individually. You can also look at that oh, organizationally. Companies will be better with AI. Uh, countries or states will be better, but what about the ones who do not have it, you see? So that's when I would say, okay, you can put it all out there, but then, hold on, who, uh, this AI, is this going to be held by certain companies or certain countries? You know, we know there was a major nation state leader who said last week that the country that controls AI will control the world. So That was the Russian leader, wasn't it? <laughs> so, you know, I think the question is, that's out there, all right, which right. is, you know, I talked about this this morning, which is, you know, should we start thinking about this as AI as kind of a, a basic human right? You know, if you go over to the United Nations, you know, they have a wall with the basic human rights of things that they believe in. Is, is this so going to be so fundamental to our society that every country should have, every person, should, every company right. should have some kind of democratized access that AI is a basic human right. And that is a, you know, AI is not an SDG, you know, today, but should it be? Or should it be part of all the SDGs? Um, should there be a UN special envoy for AI? Is this big enough that over the next decade, that we all need to be so focused to be able to provide this kind of democratization of it. So that, well, that's, that's a, what's on, that's kind of the beginning. And I have another part of that. I don't want to take up any more time. Well, that's a fantastic set of questions and very provocative. And I think that- No, you're going to answer them now, aren't you? For me? <laughs> no, oh. my role, I'm just here to ask, ask questions. I'm a journalist. Okay. Um, you, you guys are the experts. So I'm going to turn to Sunil though, who can maybe provide some answers. Um, I saw you shaking your head a couple of times as Mark was speaking. Do you agree that um, AI is going to be the hot topic, that maybe we should be looking at more discussion about AI? Do you like the idea of self-driving battleships, or do you think that there needs to be more done at the grassroots of, say, India, where you're very obviously involved, to actually deal with the most basic steps of technology? Well, you know, I'm a great believer of technology. In fact, uh, technology needs to drive, uh, you know, the societies going forward. But coming from the countries that I operate in, um, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Sub-Saharan Africa, I think we leave the AI to Mark and the Western world to deal with. Uh, it will eventually find its way into our economies. But uh, for us, uh, technology is not a, a question of uh, if and when. It's got to be used now because it's an imperative that uh, countries that I operate in and many more similar countries need to adopt fast most of the monies that uh, the world has at its disposal needs to be directed towards technologies that will ensure that the underdeveloped countries, low developed countries, emerging markets uh, adopt the use of these technologies. My countries don't have the luxury of 30, 40, 50 years of economic development to build their uh, physical infrastructures, roads, ports, airports, etc. They don't have that luxury. But thankfully, they can mitigate their absence of those hard infrastructure by way of technology. Uh, SDGs, if you look at them, eight of them talk about, in some form or shape, financial inclusion. Uh, India has, for example, 100,000 bank branches, about 110,000 ATMs. Uh, but today, society do not need those bank branches. We don't need those brick and mortars. We don't need ATMs. Every low-cost smartphone is an ATM now. My own company has 1.75 million outlets in India. You just have to extend your arm and you have a shop, a cigarette vendor or a grocery shop where you can vend money, you can dispense money, you can pay, you can transfer money wherever you want. Uh, on the mobile phone, we give micro insurance, you can give micro credit. The world has changed. In the last four years, between 2011 and 2014, 15, 500 million people have got financial inclusion. However, there are two billion people who have no access to any form of financial instrument. But one billion of those have a mobile phone. We can get them on as fast as we can, and we are doing that. The whole industry is doing that. Uh, E-commerce has revolutionized the country. Uh, our logistics are very difficult, very expensive. It's cut down on logistics, warehouses, intermediation, all gone away. 40, 50 percent reduction in prices have happened uh, in the hands of customers. Life expectancy has gone up. 
infant mortality has gone down because of uh, healthcare interventions through technology. And in my view, therefore, uh, countries like India, which have adopted digital uh, as one of the major platforms our Prime Minister has taken upon himself, as one of the big pillars is Digital India, in which he wants to connect everybody in the country in the shortest possible time frame. And we are talking about 18, 24 months. Every Indian will have a phone in their hand. On top of that, what has been done is every Indian now has a national identity, which is linked to biometrics. It takes you less than one minute. You put your thumb in any place you go in India. Every store will have a $20 device. Put your thumb in, in one minute, you are verified. Is saving India alone $8 billion every year. Wow. And that is on the back of that, you are generating new services which the government could have never possibly delivered to its right. population. So technology is an imperative. We have no choice but to use technology. I know there are fears around the world. Some you know, people, very significant people, talk about what robots can do to humanity, how technology can uh, take away the you know, life out of societies. In my own opinion, I would not worry about a robot coming and biting my backside. I will better <laughs> technology. Right. Well, there's definitely an interesting split, I must say, between the Western world, which tends to be much more concerned about technology today, and many developing countries which are wildly enthusiastic. Or even a country like Japan, which has a shrinking population, doesn't have the same attitude towards technology as a place like America. But I'm curious, Marianne, you're trying to take technology solutions from the UK, from elsewhere, into Africa and to try and do some of what Mittal's been doing in India. Tell us a bit about how you see this debate. I mean, I'm sitting in between two of my heroes. Mark is my hero because I used to sell his solutions to government in Africa. And Mr. Patel is like one of my heroes because every time I travel to Africa, I see Etel in every single airport. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of, one of the angles I would like to bring here is really the human center aspect. The, you know, Mark is talking about the b battleship, but who's going to build the battleship for him? You know, I think right now we're forgetting women and girls across the world. And so you know, my company is really focused on tech going to Africa, but I'm, I've been really focusing on, on women and girls recently in the last couple of years. Now, how do you make sure women and girls have got their say on the whole technology uh, industry, the digital world? And, and they're completely forgotten. So I live in the UK, for example, where you, know, you have now amazing middle class women who are digitally illiterate. And so they're having the Senegalese woman who never been to school, so I've never, you know, I'd never been to school. I started reading and writing when I was 16 years old. And I learned how to code seven languages in two years. Mm. And so now, you know, I'm the best Python coder in my company, for example. And so now you, you, you see skills being transferred from, you know, from the West to, to, from Africa, to kind of like to the West. You know, we just launched I Am The Code in China, where you have now, you know, we're going and teaching Chinese girls and, and Japanese girls how to code. And the whole conversation around technology is, is shifting, where you see now technology is ageless, is, is borderless, and, and you know, is classless. No, you know, it's not just the, the middle class person who will have access to technology. I've got my girls in Uganda coding two languages. I share in Senegal code two languages from Java to Python. You go to, uh, in the UK, some young girls can't even code one language. And so, you know, who's going to build my, uh, you know, mark battleship? I think that's what my argument is. <laughs> and I think the second point is, you know, we need to talk about digital divide, marginalized communities. Uh, you know, Africa is leapfrogging, India is leapfrogging. You've got like Argentina girls are coding now in Spanish. And you do have so many coding languages, actually the West are so behind. I get really worried actually for the West. So technology will bring actually poverty in all these communities because women in the UK, for example, they, they feel they don't need to code, they don't need to learn languages. And we will need, in Africa on its own, we will need one million coders by 2030. China on its own, I mean, I saw Jack Ma in China where you have Chinese coders coding from C Sharp, where you have African coders sitting down in Uganda and in Lagos coding actually, you know, Python and Java. The, the, the gap is so huge, it's unbelievable. So you now you, you're gonna find out in the next, in the next five, ten, in the next 10 years, if the West doesn't kind of like look into Africa and India, it will be completely different. So my work is really based on that right now, but right. also, you know, giving girls job. You know, how do you use technology for young girls to get the skills, uh, the fourth industrial revolution skills of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure girls are building e-commerce sites in Senegal, e-commerce sites in Burkina Faso, you know, fashion and industry, how do you make sure young women are participating in this? And that really excites me at the moment. And, uh, and that's why, you know, I just really think that having this platform here, the World Economic Forum, and co-chairing co the summit, it's really crucial to give women and girls the voice they need to be part of this industry. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I would love to see, I don't know if anyone's drawn up a heat map 
showing the world and the sort of level of coding skills per head of population or per capita. Mm -hmm. It'll be fascinating to see that and see that by gender as well, because maybe someone in the room has done that or seen that, but I've never seen that, and I'd love to know where the greatest levels of digital literacy actually were today. Um, and also across America, it'd be fascinating to see that across America. I mean, mm -hmm. when you hear somebody saying, well, actually, if the West doesn't get its act together, educationally wise, they will end up being outcoded by lots of super smart mm -hmm. kids in you know, Uganda or China or anywhere else. How does that make you feel and what are you doing to try and cope with some of these challenges, mm -hmm. Governor? Uh, it makes me feel ignorant because I don't have an answer to that question totally. But um, first off, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I raised uh, three teenage sons. Uh, and so anytime people act like they care about what I think about the future of the world, it's unique in my life. So thank you very much for having me here. Um, <laughs> So your, your question uh, it goes to an equality issue. And if I can kind of uh, pivot to the Twitter answers, I can. Because your Twitter answers show what I think of this whole subject matter, which is that uh, we ought to be optimistic about the ability not only to grow the pie, but actually to grow equality if we do things right. We ought to be able to answer using technology the things that the Twitter answer said were the most important. I was really intrigued. About 70, 75% of the answers said technology. What they're most optimistic about is the ability to solve environmental challenges. Mm -hmm. And we just came from our climate summit with Jerry Brown and Mike Bloomberg, in other words, and, and Al Gore today talking about our what we, we call the can-do coalition. It's a group of 14 states that have banded together to defeat climate change, even though the president has abandoned efforts in that regard. And I just think what the folks said in your Twitter answers uh, are right about being optimistic if we do three things. Number one, we focus on talent, which is the single most important thing in the technological revolution, in this industrial revolution. And that's where guys like me who are governors, le state legislators, members of Congress coming in. And new kind of talent development. I'll just mention two things we're doing in Washington State. Uh, last week, I went to the opening of GIX. It is a consortium of the University of Washington and Tsinghua University. It's in Bellevue, Washington. So Microsoft is also a partner in it. It is the first collaboration of a Chinese and, and American university to really give people hands-on ability to do project-based learning and research, an entirely way, different way of thinking about a university system and university research. Second, in the state of Washington, we're developing an apprenticeship program. 60% of all the graduates from high schools in Switzerland have an apprenticeship certification the day they get out of high school so they can go to work. We should have our children have the same situation. We're developing that. We've now had the first 46 apprentices in coding in the United States. We started an apprenticeship program for coders. Second issue is connectivity. And I, I look at connectivity as just a secret of, of maximizing technological benefit. And I think of when the president uh, dropped his refugee ban and travel ban on us. It blocked a guy named Dr. Ala Alwan, who is a researcher with the World Health Organization, from coming to a, a World Health Organization that Melinda Gates was, was helping organize. We were able to get him in. And preserving the connectivity of peoples is fundamental to the success of technology. And the third is the idea of promoting innovation for the common. And I think this is an important issue. If innovation is just for those who can afford new consumer products, an easier way to turn on your television, an easier way to monitor your refrigerator and stock your refrigerator, it will not truly the answers uh, solve the problems of humanity. We have to drive policies that will drive innovation to common problems. That's why we're focusing on this climate alliance in driving innovation policies to drive technologies to solve climate change, not just how to keep a pizza stocked in my refrigerator. That's an important issue too. But we need to drive public investment into those common problems that's fundamental, but I believe we're gonna succeed. Right, well that's fascinating. That's quite a nicely concise call to arms. But um, I'm curious, I'd like to turn to you, Johan, and ask about the environmental aspect, because as I said, on the Twitter poll, um, out of people who were optimistic about technology, 53% said they thought that sustainable energy would be the main area where technology helped to meet SDGs, and 22% said environmental pollution, and then 11% at plastics in the ocean. 
So tell us how you're looking at the technology equation from the perspective of somebody who is a leader in the field of environmental resilience. Mm. Yeah, l let me start by corroborating the poll to say that there's no doubt scientifically that a fourth industrial revolution is something we are embarking onto and that it's a necessity if we're serious about achieving the sustainable development goals. So there's no doubt that we need this exponential rise in innovation and disruptive transformations. In fact, decarbonizing the world economy in 33 years, which is a necessity to stay under two degrees Celsius, the planetary guard well has achieved or agreed upon in Paris, is a revolution to feed nine and a half billion co-citizens by 2050, 8.5 billion by 2030, is an agrarian revolution. Moreover, it has to be sustainable and healthy. So I would even argue that, you know, just two blocks down when heads of state signed the Sustainable Development Goals, one reason why they made this phenomenal accomplishment may have actually been that they didn't really understand what they signed. Because, because <laughs> it's such a phenomenal roadmap for people and planet of, of revolutionary proportions. But, but I think the key message from science is the following. We've had revolutions before. We've had an agricultural revolution, we've had an industrial revolution, which could operate on a resilient planet. It didn't have to be sustainable. In fact, the Earth system subsidized the previous industrial revolutions by allowing us to overexploit natural resources, undermine biodiversity, overfish the oceans, and moreover, put so much pressure in the atmosphere and heat in the oceans, that the whole system just pushed our damage and abundance under the carpet and could absorb without sending any invoices back to the economy. Now, we have to reconfigure for the fourth industrial revolution for the first time ever. It will certainly be another exponential journey. You know, the, the previous revolutions were so exponential that science today invites humanity to a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene where we have become the human dominating force of change at the planetary scale. Now, the fourth industrial revolution will certainly also be exponential. It has to be exponential for the human side of, of our challenge, but it has to succeed within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient Earth system between the boundaries that science can today set for a stable Earth system. Now, is this a constraint on the fourth industrial revolution? Probably not. It probably is signaling to innovators and entrepreneurs and, and, and you know, all the big industry and communities around the world that, that the depth of innovation must be even more challenging. You know, if you want to digitalize mobility in the world and also decarbonize it, it will be an mm. even more rapid innovation mm. pathway. We've come so far in this that we realized, holding hands with business and scientific community, that we need to set science-based targets for this safe operating space for the fourth industrial revolution. If I may say so, how we domesticate the fourth industrial revolution to keep it within the boundaries of the Earth system. That we're suggesting actually during this week that we now should set up an Earth Commission. An Earth Commission with one task, to bring forward the science-based targets of the two degrees Celsius equivalents for climate for all the systems on the planet for the fourth industrial revolution on biodiversity, oceans, nitrogen, phosphorus, land, forest, so that we know within what guardrails do we now need to, so to say, operate this fourth industrial revolution. So there's something new happening here which uh, is, is completely novel in terms of the science business partnership in such a journey. Right, well that's fascinating. So an AI commission, an Earth, um, Earth commission, um, I'm curious, you know, does anyone else from the panel have a strong view about what they'd like to see that come out this week in terms of practical steps or what you think the top priority is as you look at the meetings this week? Can I take a step? Yeah, sure. The governor and then Mark. You can upstage. Look, we, we have so many Upstater. things humans deal with. Um, and as a governor, I, they get smacked me in the head by 9 o'clock. I've got three things that are really important in the state of Washington. But when you only have one singular planet with one singular atmosphere that is quite a number of light years from the next exoplanet that you know, might have habitable conditions on it, the issue of whether or not we will have a sustainable atmosphere and climate has to be a unifying, fundamental, number one priority for the species 
as a whole right now. Because of all the other problems we have, no matter if we solved every problem from acne to, you know, uh, you name it, speeding, that would be totally useless without a sustainable system. And our system that now sustains basic life on the planet is in dire jeopardy. And if you doubt that, come to Seattle where ash was falling like the apocalypse last week, where our forests are raging, where islands are actually going underwater, where the glaciers are melting at unprecedented levels, our basic level of sustainable is very much at risk. And it's difficult for people in public life to talk in these apocalyptic terms, but it is the case. And I've been thinking about a new way of talking about climate disruption. I, I spent a lot of time in my life as governor declaring emergencies, declaring emergencies when the Wenatchee National Forest is burning down, declaring emergencies when a whole mudslide of mountain collapses during the biggest rainstorms we've had. I'm tired of declaring temporary one-off emergencies. We've got to look at this as a planetary emergency. And there is no other way to think about it that is, a, that is adequate to the task at hand. So when I think about the fourth industrial revolution, there's many revolutions we have to have, but decarbonizing the world economy has to be fundamental because everything else will fail. And I'm glad that uh, we got a UN that's working on this. I'm not proud that our president has wanted us to put us in league with Syria on this. And I don't blame Nicaragua, they didn't sign because they wanted a stronger uh, measure than Paris. So uh, uh, I, I'm going right. to nominate that. Well, I think Johan's got a, someone who's going to sign up to the Earth Commission <laughs> straight away. <laughs> but I see You're welcome Mark. as a commissioner. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Mark and Marianne. Marianne, do you want to speak first and then Mark? I think what I would like to see is we need to start decoding the sustainable development goals. At the moment, we're talking about sustainable development goals, and it's not really human-centric at the moment. So I would like to see the, the goals being decoded at the human level, uh, especially the grassroots, the people who are the recipient of uh, you know, all these goals, the targets and the indicators in the end. I would like, really would like to see that. And also involve the women and the girls uh, you know, on the ground. You, know, you have the industries. Who, you know, they are desperate to find skilled people. You know, what are we going to do for the next you know five ten years if we don't have skilled people you know who understand how to you know collect data for example you know I love technology and my girls in, in Africa around the world they love technology and why should we not use the, the sustainable development goals as a right. way of breaking the barriers and giving them the tools they need to become prosperous right Mark yeah, yeah thank you I you know there's a I just want to make kind of two basic points one is uh, and I'm sure, you know, as we kind of look at this huge expansion of technology and what's going on, we we'll have to pivot back to our own humanity. And the only way we're going to get through this is by all working together. Uh, that, in, that includes all stakeholders. One of the reasons I love the World Economic Forum is because, you know, for business, it's not about your shareholders, it's about your stakeholders. And the environment, education, gender equality, these are all our critical stakeholders. I, I really think until we shift our consciousness to realize that we are all responsible for this. So we cannot rely on our government leaders or our business leaders or our NGO leaders. Everyone has to be part of it. At Salesforce, when I look at something like the environment, you know, to me, I said this earlier, I'm kind of, kind of connected together, the environment is a quality. We know what happens when the environment goes wrong because you see the inequalities that it, will, it has created and it will create. You saw that in the hurricanes even. Um, but that's one of the reasons we accelerated our net zero uh, programs. We're now 100% net zero at Salesforce. We're the first net zero cloud. We're the fourth largest software company uh, in the world. We're the fastest growing software company in the world. We're net zero. That means every other technology company can be net zero. But we have to like make that decision. We talk about education and I think you said it really well, education is also a quality. To me, it's, it's all bundled into the same world. And back where I am in San Francisco, where we have our headquarters, and I look at our public school systems, which have, you know, have significant challenges, we, have, we are, have a private commitment to put $100 million into our San Francisco and Oakland school districts, and also, hundreds of thousands of hours of volunteerism getting our employees to work in the school districts uh, as well, as well as providing all of the 
technology and infrastructure experience as well. We're $34 million already invested towards our $100 million goal. Um, to me, that is because Salesforce is about equality because this very much is the age of equality. If you're not pivoting right. to equality, if, you know, decarbonization, in my opinion, is not only the right thing for the planet, it is equality. If we don't have it, we're going to have vast levels of inequality. And a lot of the things that have been touched on, including workforce development, where we've called for, you know, five million apprenticeships in the United States, or gender equality, making sure that women are not only, you know, given great opportunity and advancement, but also equal pay. This is also equality. So that's where I think we really have to say, okay, this is the critical shift, and this is the value that we can bring into our organizations, into our world, that will let us, you know, accelerate right. this movement. Right. Sunil, then. Yeah, you know, we talked about this earlier in the UN. We need to write a new language. We need to start pinning down. In the end, the practitioners have to deal with this, and that's the large business community, that's the corporations, that's the small, medium enterprises. Uh, emerging markets, underdeveloped countries, uh, necessarily have to develop. And that would mean pressure on natural resources, pressure on fossil fuel, all sorts of uh, issues uh, come into play because their question is, we haven't had the chance to grow for the last 30, 40, 50 years. We have been left behind. We need to catch up for our societies. The good news there is that even countries like India, and you heard uh, Vice President Al Gore today talk about India committing itself to be 100% electric vehicles by 2030. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a tall order. Maybe it'll not be 2030, it'll be 2035 or 40, I don't know. But it's a good uh, target to put up by even countries like India which are consuming only half a barrel per capita oil a year, as opposed to 28 barrels of oil per capita in the US. Mm. Despite that, India is saying, we'll commit ourselves to go and be completely electric. 125 gigawatts of solar and wind power is being committed by the prime minister, and we are taking off solar, solar like anything. Solar prices have gone down below the grid power now. It can be done, but in the end, I have to say, Without technology, we cannot get there. Sure. Right. Celebrate technology, adopt technology, embrace technology. And yes, um, the governor is right here. Uh, would countries like mine worry about whether the refrigerator is ordering on its own or not? Absolutely not. There is so much to do, but there is stuff to be done in frugal innovation. You can do very low-cost frugal innovation for the betterment of societies. Right. I think we need leadership as well. You know, people like, we need leadership like, you know, companies like Salesforce, where you have the CEOs, we are mobilizing government, private sector, and, and investors to invest in STEM education. And I think if you want to advance STEM education, especially for women and girls, we need to have leaders who actually will commit to, you know, millions of dollars to actually go and skill the people. Right now, we're in shortage, we're in deficit of skills, technology skills, especially right. in Europe and in the United States. We don't have coders, we don't have people who understand the, the languages, so they copy and paste. And so we will have a massive problem in the next like five, 10 years where you have people who actually don't understand technology and they think technology is Facebook, right. Twitter. So we just need to start thinking about what is the sustainable development goals are, are for and how can we build the skills to give dignity to people. Right. Mm. Johan, I can see you were waiting patiently at the end. <laughs> You know, the, the, the following may come across as a bit basic, kind of an academic testimony, but, you know, the, the spirit of this panel and, and what Governors is sharing with us here is so representative of what we in the scientific community is feeling so strongly over the past only five, six, seven years that the whole environmental agenda, sustainability, has crossed a tipping point from being this big sacrifice of the trench war of what you're willing to pay to protect the environment to be the pathway towards equity, mm -hmm. towards progress, towards prosperity. Right, exactly. Basically, world 2.0. I'm a professor mm -hmm. in environmental science. Right. I would even argue, let's stop talking about the environment. I mean, there's no such thing really as the environment. What we're talking about is human prosperity, human well-being, and human equity of us as a world to survive and prosper on this planet Earth. Right. Now that we've filled up the entire right. system and that the pathway to succeed is the fourth industrial revolution that takes sustainability as the entry point for innovation and disruptive transformation. And I get always a bit really you know, frustrated when we end up having these debates of being, okay, so now the environmental community or the environmental NGOs have kind of succeeded in some demonstration in a corner here or there. 
that we are way past that. We really are. We are, just like Governor says, in a position where this is about how will Washington or how will a state in the U.S. or how will the world right. succeed with its, our development. Mm -hmm. right. so I think it's time to really take that fully on, and the World Economic yeah. Forum is the perfect place for that. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank you. Well, we are sadly out of time, but before we go, um, really we started with some Twitter, um, Twitter comments fr from the World Economic Forum, a poll. Um, we're going to end, perhaps you can tee up the rolling presentation with some comments of the World Economic Forum also gathered from its constituents, um, as I said, somewhat self-selecting. Um, but I can suggest that maybe as we bring the session to a close, we can see the comments um, because they are quite provocative and quite a good way to end and to think about where we go from now. I must say, as you see them coming up, I hope you've got better eyesight than I have, um, but as you see them coming up, my two favorites probably are these. One is one from Ursula Becker, which says, technology change without social change is a curse, mm. which I think captures very well the challenge we all face. Um, and last but not least, I think Mark Benioff's comment sums it up very well. Technology is not good or bad, it's what we do with it that matters. AI is a gift. I'm not sure necessarily self-driving um, battleships are a gift, but anyway. But anyway, leaving that aside, may we use technology for the betterment of all mankind. I think that's one sentiment that we can all agree, and let's hope the World Economic Forum this week pushes that goal forward. So thank you, and do continue to ponder these sentiments as they come across. Thanks to the panel. Thank you.